quote from someone on Reddit once. It was an anonymous person, just an anonymous person sharing what they learned. And I, and I repeat it all the time. And it's something we actually haven't touched on. The quote is, the difference between a head full of memories and a head full of regret is your ability to forgive yourself. Yeah. Self-forgiveness being the, the catalyst there. And I just, I think that's so true. Like everything we've been talking about here, right? Like how do we make, how do we make standards? Will we make sense of our past? In order to move forward, we have to find a way to forgive ourselves. And really, I talk a lot about forgiveness. You know, I think forgiving yourself is synonymous with giving yourself a second chance, trusting yourself again. And that really is back to the way we started. Like the reason I started the podcast is to avoid looking back and regretting not being honest with myself, having a, a, a heaping pile of memories, some good, some bad, but all interconnected by a sense of patience with myself and forgiveness for myself, I think is did the best gift you can give yourself. <music> Welcome Case Kenny. He's an entrepreneur, mindfulness expert, host, and founder of the Top 25 Apple Podcasts as part of Sirius XM Distribution Network. New Mindset, who dis? Beloved by some of today's biggest celebrities, including Haley Bieber, Sophia Bush, and John Kenna, to name a few. You might recognize him from his virtual coffee cup and post-it quotes on Instagram, which have been shared by millions and featured on the Today Show, Good Morning America, Women's Health, Cosmopolitan, and many more. Created in 2018, Kenny's podcast, New Mindset, Who This, features his short, no BS take on all things mindfulness in a relatable way, empowering people to be happier and live more fulfilling lives by changing their mindsets in all areas of life, spanning from self-worth, empowerment, dating, relationships, career advice, and more. The podcast has received over 6,000 five-star reviews and has held the position of top 25 podcasts on both Apple Podcasts and Spotify for the last three years. Chase is also the creator of the best-selling mindfulness journals, including the New Mindset Journal, But First, Inner Peace, Unbothered and Single is Your Superpower, and digital journals including Closure and Clarity. He recently published his first book in January 2023, That's Bold of You, a self-help book to guide readers on how to let go of self-judgment. All right, welcome back to another episode on Passion Love Pursuit Podcast. I have Chase Kenny on the show. And I'm just so honored to go deep into this conversation with you. Uh, I know you talk about all the things, but you talk about one of my most favorite subjects, which is actually relationships. And personally, uh, it's one of the things I struggled most in. It's probably where I've felt the most pain. So I love going into the conversation of relationships, especially because I think it's it's the place that a lot of people have a lot of questions, uh, want to know all the things, and they're confused because there's lots out there, but they really just want a simple way to really improve their relationships and not feel as much pain possibly in the relationships they have had or stepping into. So I love that you talk much about that, but you also talk a lot about mindfulness. And I think that is at the foundation of really anything we do in life is really how do we cultivate mindfulness, which is really going within, developing that self-awareness and getting really in tune with ourselves so that we could lead our life opposed to uh, letting life lead us. And so I know you speak so heavily about that. So anyways, welcome Chase to the podcast. Hello. Thank you for having me. Um, quick note. I don't know if, sorry, it's actually Case and I don't care, but I don't, if you're, uh, if you want to have it right. I don't know if you wanted to redo that. I'm sorry. Yes. I should have said that when you first said no, that. No, it's so funny. Okay. So I literally, so we were introduced from a mutual podcaster friend, mm -hmm. uh, Doug Bose. And it's so funny. I kept on saying to him, Chase, because we know another podcaster, which I don't know if you know, Chase Tuning. And so I of always yeah, I get yeah. confused. <laughs> so thank yeah. you for correcting me. I oh, honestly, of course, it's not a big deal. And honestly, my yeah. name is Casey. But I go by Case, so if it makes it easier for you to remember, it is Casey. But everyone calls me Case. Um, but I can see it, I it's should... confusing. I don't know a lot of cases, so <laughs> exactly. So, anyways, I apologize for saying that wrong, but okay. I honestly <laughs> have said it wrong every single time. So, I'm not even gonna honestly. I'm not even gonna take this out of the episode if you don't mind. I'm just gonna keep it real. 
Wow, Honestly, let's keep it real. Case, Love it. yeah. So thank you for <laughs> correcting me. Well, anyways, um, I am just so happy to go deep into this conversation and let's see where this goes. But I do want to talk about um, a lot of the subjects you do talk about, which really stems from the mindfulness. And you went deep into this subject yourself and your personal growth. But for those that don't know you from your wildly successful podcast or your very popular following on social media and all the uh, the lines and quotes you share on your social media, which actually to mention is where I first stumbled upon you, hmm. I don't remember specifically the line you shared. But I'm going to pull out some because I wrote them down this morning that just kind of I gravitated towards and uh, some of those life is better when sorry life is better with someone who brings you clarity not confusion that's a great one don't look for apologies look for change behavior most certainly you're not too much for someone who isn't enough for you so you share these powerful one-liners that I know are popular for a reason because they really speak volumes just in the ones I shared. Like I know everybody could be like, yeah, for sure. So I didn't know of you, but I knew of your lines and I remember that's what I gravitated towards. So if you could kind of share what even led you into kind of the cliff note version, what led you into being a wildly successful podcaster and how you got so passionate about mindfulness relationships and all that you talk for about. sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the quick two minute summary would be that. So I'm 35 currently. I joke that, you know, my, what I do, I share my feelings for a living. That's my career title. That's my joke. Um, and it really is pretty accurate. Like I'm not trying to be an expert. I'm not trying to be a life coach. I'm not trying to tell anyone how to live their life. I share my feelings. And really where that came from was in my late twenties at a certain point in my life, um, you know, somewhere between a breakup and my job, I worked in advertising for 13 years before moving into this full time. I was leading a sales team out of Chicago. I was traveling a lot. I basically hit that point where I was like, man, you know, got a lot going on, doing a lot of different things. It would be really unfortunate if I looked back and call it 10, 15, 20 years and realized that I never took a step back and challenged myself to say, why am I dating the people that I'm dating? Why do I have the dreams I have? Why do I feel the way I have? I feel why am I pursuing a career X, Y, Z? I mean, I was just kind of fired up in that, in that moment being like, man, I, I, I am motivated by regret, specifically inner regret, the idea that I left something on the table or the idea that I only borrowed aspirations for myself. So that it was a very organic, you know, you can call it a quarter life crisis if you want. I don't think crisis is the right word in any sense. But basically, my solution in 2018 was I'm going to start a podcast. Um, a little less common in 2018, I suppose, but I basically saw it as a vulnerable way to express myself for myself, to ask myself questions, to relay what I've learned in a, in, in a way that helped me. Um, and if it helped other people, great. Really, what happened was I started releasing episodes. It started to do really well right off the bat. Fast forward, I've done 500 episodes. I've released books, products, the, the whole thing. But really what I realized through the process of asking myself questions or asking myself common questions and giving my perspective was really what I was doing. I was practicing mindfulness. I was practicing the art of self-awareness, honesty combined with action. Um, and that's it. Um, so a really interesting story, I suppose, of just like pulling on a thread of interest and need. And it led me in a direction of something that really, really helps me. I always say the podcast is my therapy. And then lo and behold, it helps other people. And then the whole Instagram thing, it's like my, the mindfulness that I gravitate towards is obvious. It's simple. Like the things I write on Instagram, they're not particularly earth shattering. It's just right. very succinct ways to state what we already know, maybe in a, in a different way, maybe in a way that someone needs to be reminded of. And that's the mindfulness that I gravitate towards. We all know, you know, right from wrong. Generally speaking, we, we could identify certain things. We just, we're not very good at creating clarity for ourselves around it. And we're not great at having our actions follow. So for me, I just am very drawn to practical, logical mindfulness. Um, and that's kind of really what I'm passionate about, whether it's on the podcast or in my books um, or the different products I've created or on Instagram, just reminding myself of simple truths, simple ways to examine life so that we don't look back and regret, uh, you know, different things or relationships or a career move. So that's the, the, maybe that was three minutes. That's the three minutes summary no, of, of how we got here. 
You know, it's so, uh, that's what I honestly love is you're speaking truth to people where they need to be reminded. It's things that people already know, but I think so very often, and I'm sure you even do this yourself at times, it's like we get into this negative spiral and we don't look at the truth and the reality of really the simplicity of somewhat life is. And I think we, as we get older, we realize these truths, but we still in our own shitty situation, if you want to say, mm. we we don't see it as clear. And so you're kind of, what you're sharing, like you said, it's so simple. The ones I read are so simple, but they speak such life and truth. So that's really awesome. And, yeah. uh, you know, funny enough, I uh, very much relate to kind of your journey and in getting into podcasting. I started, as I mentioned to you, in 2019, thought of it in 2018. Of course, I had that imposter syndrome, like, yep. who am I Same. to release a personal development podcast? And I, it's funny because I really relate to your story because again, the same thing, kind of in a selfish way, I wanted to grow myself, but yet in a very serving way, sharing this journey mm -hmm. along with mm -hmm. others. Uh, so I jumped into it as well to further my growth and to have these conversations with others so that, you know, not only can I become a better person, learn about the topics I love, which is really all the ways I could grow as a human, become my best self. Uh, so yes, I really, really relate to that. What's awesome is you actually, like you said, started doing these solo episodes. So I'm kind of wondering to share this knowledge so powerfully as you had and people really gravitating to your message, was there a catalyst or somebody that you, let's say somebody was a mentor for you that led you into your personal growth? Because I'm curious, because I know that you speak about relationships a lot, uh, was there a pain point that you went deep on because you wanted to avoid maybe something you've endured and then you learned a lot about it and then you're able to share the wisdom on the other flip side? Yeah, it's, it's a combination of things. I mean, I do reference a breakup that I had when I was 29. That was one of those relationships that needed to end. Like, we just weren't right for each other. It wasn't like a toxic thing or anything. It just needed to end. Um, and I, I reference that a lot because that's just so emblematic of how a lot of us live, myself obviously included, which is we live in this gray area of life where we're like, ah, oh, this should probably end, but it's comfortable. Or I don't want to do that. Or I don't want to hurt her. Or I don't want to start over, right? These 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 little ways that we get our claws in stagnancy and we refuse to move. So I reference that a lot as a catalyst, but really the catalyst behind that and really what I think has led me to be so passionate about this is I'm very type A. Um, I'm very stubborn. Um, you know, that is just the way I am. And obviously there's certain areas of life where I need to work on that. But when it comes to, to mindfulness and um, the way that I've of approach content and, and creating and, and myself, it's been very serving because basically at that point, I was like, I am fed up with having question marks in my head, but not doing the work of introspection to find some kind of answer. So I was like, I want to replace question marks with exclamation marks. Like I have to do this. So I was very like self-motivated to sit down and share my feelings. Um, and, and basically what I realized through that is like, at the same time, I was also very averse to like self-development and self-help. I was always kind of cynical in the sense of like, who are other people to tell me what to do? Or like, how, how do they know the right way to life? And in, in a sense, I still am a little cynical towards like advice that fits into like rules or whatever it may be. The reason that I've gravitated so much so towards mindfulness is mindfulness is is question driven. It is question, why do I feel this way? Or why is this person triggering me? So on and so forth. And you come up with your own answers that are inherently yours, that are through the lens of your experiences and the conclusions that you can make based on your life. And I'm so drawn towards that because the power then becomes the power of the question and the power of your, your honesty. It's not someone else telling you what to do. It's not a blueprint for life. It's none of that. So I became very drawn to realizing that through my type A mentality, through past mistakes that I've made, where if only I had just had the the courage to do something a little uncomfortable, I could have come up with these answers myself. So I became very drawn to this style of self-development in the form of mindfulness, where there's no right answers, there's your answer, but it, it's right in the sense of you're actually being honest for once. And that's where I became very drawn to this. And then you combine that with type A and, and you know, all these kinds of things and I also realized, you know, just like anything in life, you want to reference things like the 10,000 hour rule and muscles and sports is like mindfulness is a muscle. The, the more you practice mindfulness, the better you get at it. 
and 500 episodes, hundreds of thousands of pages written. I, I've gotten so much better at it for myself. So it just became this, this great thing where I just became very self-motivated to practice this muscle and develop it and realize that, you know, I don't have to be thrown by self-development or anything like that. Just, just ask myself questions and give my perspective on it. And it helps me and it helps other people. And it's just been so rewarding. I completely relate to what you're saying. And as you talked about that, I realized in my journey and where I had the most growth is when I had that mindfulness where I was going within that self inquiry and asking myself questions. And actually, which I talk about a lot is that radical honesty. Like how many times do we lie to ourselves and we tell e ourselves these <laughs> stories that are absolutely yeah. like so ludicrous that you're like, you get yourself in a spiral of thinking so negatively and, and distorting the reality of what is. And I just remember that whole, you know, I didn't even realize, I guess I was practicing mindfulness when I, like, when I talk about relationships, like I don't share this story a whole lot, but uh, I have shared that most of my pain came in relationships. And I got to a point where like enough is enough. Like, okay, I'm the common denominator in this situation, obviously. So now I got to turn the mirror on myself. What, why is this happening? And that's when I started to do the self inquiry. I worked with a life coach at this time to really ask the right questions. Like, why am yeah. I telling myself this story? Is this really true? Like really and starting to journal about that. And it's, mm -hmm. I don't do a, I, and you totally inspire me to journal by the way, because oh, you make me realize okay. how powerful it is. And I do share it, but I don't, I don't do the action as often as I would like to do. I do it when I'm needing to do it, meaning where I really need to go deep on asking myself certain questions. But I know that is one thing you speak so heavily about and actually was part of your journey is that journaling and you now have released so many journals that help others in the same process. Mm. So can you speak about how journaling has served you in this self inquiry, asking yourself these powerful questions and what did you find helped you the most? Like what questions really served you in evolving yourself and becoming more like deepening that mindfulness? Yeah, well, I'd say a couple of things. I mean, I think the thing that I realized was, uh, you know, I think we'd all agree to a certain extent, one of the purposes of life is to go out and find answers, right? We grow up, we're searching for answers, we find answers. We forget that the key to finding answers is to ask ourselves questions. So obviously I came to realize that, and that's what we're talking about here, mindfulness. And then, you know, it's like, well, how do you ask yourself the right questions? Well, you know, one of the great answers would be therapy, have someone who's trained to ask you questions. But as a man, and like a lot of men are, or I hope are no longer averse to therapy. I can't go to therapy, forget that. So I landed on journaling because again, I was motivated to find a way to do this. And I'm not saying it's good to be averse to therapy. That's wrong. <laughs> but at, at the point of my life where I was, I was like, I'm going to let me let me journal. Like people talk about journaling. Like this sounds pretty cool. Maybe this is a way to really open myself up. And then I, I remember in, I don't know, like 2017, 18, I, I went out and bought a bunch of journals and um, got my hands on a lot. And I realized really when it came to actual journals and guided journals, they, they either fit in one of two categories, it seemed to me. They were either too much like it stressed me out to have to do this journal because it was like in the morning write down your goals come back after lunch and give yourself progress and then at the end of the day talk about how proud you are and i was like that stresses me out more than not journaling and like i was like i don't know if that's for me it's too much and then the other side of journaling was stream of consciousness how are you feeling today share your thoughts internal dialogue and i'm a little add so for me to sit down and fill a blank page just didn't really work for me i was like i need a little bit of guidance so my entrepreneurial side kind of kicked in and my self uh, motivation side kicked in. I was like, let me create a journal that combines the best of both worlds, prompted and unprompted. And basically the story is there. I started creating these journals, questions that I knew I needed to ask myself, um, questions that I think other people should ask themselves. And the rest is history there. But really what I realized through that pro process, of course, is the role of journaling, right? Asking yourself questions. But then more so it's like, I call it a journaler's mentality. It's like, you get, should, and I hope people get value from their journaling session, whether it's 10 minutes or an hour. I hope you get immediate value. Like, wow, I never thought of that. 
But I think the real value of journaling is what you take with it after you're done journaling, which is a sense of internal curiosity, a sense of not sitting in ambivalence or ambiguity or confusion. It's that internal drive to say, if something is bothering me, if I'm confused in a conversation, if I don't know where I stand with someone, so on and so forth, I will speak up. I will ask questions. Um, so really, that's what I've discovered is the true, true value of journaling. It's not just something you do when you're sad, for one. It's also not something that you only do when your stress is about to bubble oil over. It's something that you do perpetually, hopefully, because it's practicing that muscle that you then take with you. Um, and emphasis on the point of like journaling isn't just for sad people or depressed people or anxious people. It should yeah. it should be a celebration of yourself as much as it is a tool to turn to when you do feel at a crossroads. So very much have leaned into the power of journaling uh, because it's everything that we've been talking about. It's mindfulness in its simplest form where there's no expectations. You could do it in private. You could do it any time. There's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. And then there's, you know, science with mind, body connection and writing. Um, so yeah, very passionate about, about the, the medium and of course the, the purpose of it. Absolutely. It's so true. It's, it's great to, I remember seeing this one picture, uh, shared on social media where it was like a jumble of strings like that's your mind usually. And then when you put it yeah. in a journal, it's like all laid out, <laughs> you know, it kind of unravels all the uh, mess. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what are some questions you feel are the powerful, like if you, if somebody was just to get started in journaling and they're going to grab your journal on Amazon, what's like, what's the journal that is most popular that you sell now? Because I know you sell a few of them. What is it called? Uh, the, my best one is the, the first one I actually created, which is called the new mindset journal. It's a 60 day guided journal for just general life clarity. Um, Great. you know, I, I've created, I've created other ones that are focused on anxious thoughts. I've created one for, yeah. for dating, um, because I do think a specific line of questioning for specific areas of life is very, very valuable. Um, but the new mindset journal is really powerful. Um, just because it's, it's, it's pointed and poignant and specific. Um, you know, I think a lot of the battle, is generally, I think, when it comes to feeling overwhelmed or anxious or whatever it may be, it's because our head is likely not in the present. It's likely not where we want it to be. It's either in the past, present, or future. So I think a you know a strong question that you should try to open up with is, where's my head right now, past, present, or future? Let's at least calibrate where our head is so that we could get a little closer, like with a radar detector of where that little beep is, where is the thing that is confusing us? Where is the thing that is distracting us? And so we can address it. I also think a really powerful journal journal prompt that I do a lot, um, like repetitively is just a, a journal prompt of I'm the kind of person who, and then you fill it in with verb statements because the, the whole purpose of mindfulness isn't just unveiling how you feel and where that feeling is coming from. It's pairing it with action that you could follow to help you evolve or heal or forgive. You know, mindfulness without verbs is, I don't want to say useless in any sense, but we need to follow it with action so that we make it real. A journal prompt, like I'm the kind of person who I've always found is really powerful. You say, I'm the kind of person who, you know, instead of saying wants to be happy, you say, I'm the kind of person who practices gratitude every day, who is committed to his friends, is willing to try anything once, like verb statements, so that you can follow the verb statements and the verb statements are aligned with your mindfulness. So, you know, things like that, I find really powerful. Connecting self-awareness with action is how you make mindfulness real. And it's also how you, it keeps you coming back to journaling and therapy and mindfulness because it, it takes it out of your head and into the world from your inner life to your outer life. And I think the best journals do that. It's not just about getting lost in your thoughts. It's about finding mm -hmm. clarity in your thoughts and then going out and, and creating actions from it. I love that finding their uh, clarity in your thoughts. I think that is a really powerful statement in itself. And I think uh, one thing I like about that question, I'm kind of person that it's actually discovering yourself. Cause I think a lot of people, honestly, and I could speak for myself at one point, I was really disconnected from who I was like, who am I? Cause I felt mm -hmm. I was living this life for some, some time being inauthentic and not really truly knowing who I was, or if you want to say disconnected from my authentic self. And so I think in that question, you, you start to discover who you're being in the world. And are you in alignment with who you want to become? And I think that's a powerful statement in itself is like, okay, if I want to be a person of integrity, honesty, of, you know, 
doing what I love, achieving my certain goals and living a purposeful life, you got to know who am I being at this present moment? And is that in alignment with who I want to become? So I think that's, that's a beautiful question. I think anybody should start there just to gain more yeah. clarity on who are you? <laughs> like, who are you yeah. and are you in alignment with who you truly want to become? Because I think yeah. we are ever evolving and becoming, right? That's the journey of life. So... Yeah, I think yeah, I, I think that's ninety percent of the battle of life is if you could answer the, the question you just referenced and you could sit down and be honest about that who that person is and what it looks like, I think the the rest will I don't want to say fall into place, but it'll be much more clear for you. And I think a big part of the battle of what we're talking about here is you know becoming the person you want to become is unbecoming the person you're not. And journaling, therapy, mindfulness is the key to that. It's letting go of things that you've borrowed, letting go of labels that other people have put on you. I wrote a book called That's Bold of You, which is basically a, a way to reinvent yourself in the face of labels. You're too much, you're too difficult, you're too loud, you're too quiet. Things that have become self-belief based on how other people have treated us or misunderstood us. And like, that's the point of life. It's to reinvent yourself as many times as needed, but you're reinventing around clarity that you found as far as who you are, not who you're told to be, not maybe who you've become as a result of past traumas, but who you actually want to be and who you're capable of and letting go of the rest. And easier said than done, of course, this sounds all nice here and it could be a lifelong right. pursuit, but it's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, I think it is so, so critical. And I think when we're, you know, if we start to move into like a talk about relationships, I think the best way to have a, if you want to say stable foundation in a relationship is really knowing yourself and being authentic to you. Because I think when you're inauthentic in a relationship and you don't know yourself, I think it's a really unstable foundation. And I think, well, we'll go into a whole lot about relationships. At least I have a lot of questions. Again, this is something I'm super passionate about. And I think honestly, as I was speaking about, I think why to my knowledge, your podcast is so wickedly popular. It's called New Mindset Who Dis. If you're not following it, of course, subscribe, listen. I know you will after this because Case is amazing. But uh, talking about relationships, I think in my personal opinion, again, I talked about my pain in relationships. When I started to really journal about it and ask myself these questions like, okay, I'm the common denominator in these relationships. Mm -hmm. Why aren't they not working? Like, what's my part? Because I'm 100% responsible of how I show up in these relationships. And I realized for myself that I wanted a man with integrity, respect, honesty, you know, that that valued me and valued himself, that was self-discipline, you know, like all these qualities I think we all really value and want. But I, again, turned the mirror myself and I realized I wasn't showing up as that in the relationship. So how could I expect that in return? Right. Yeah. And, uh, so going into relationships, what is your personal opinion on, you know, I, I know you talk about the single, the single time before you enter a relationship. What do you think is key to building that foundation within yourself so that you could bring your best into the relationship? Uh, where would you yeah. suggest people to start? Yeah. Question, um, I well, I, I can talk for hours about this. So I think <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the simplest answer, because I, I don't like I'm in a relationship um, and we have a great relationship, but I don't, I don't know about relationships. I'm not an expert in relationships. It, it's the funniest thing in the world that I give what would be categorized as dating advice. But yeah. still, it's through the lens of my influence. It's through the lens of questions you could ask yourself, perspective to take, not rules, not do this, do that. Like, I don't know. Who am I to say? I still think it's hilarious. Um, that people call but, you, you know, a I'm 35. I, I, yeah. I mean, and it is what it is. Like I'll take the title. Like when I do interviews and stuff, it's, it's, it is what it is, but I, I still think it's so funny. Um, <laughs> but, you know, but I have learned a thing or two, of course, in my personal life and I've learned the power of my infamous, but to answer your question, I mean, I think that a couple things run, I, I wrote a book called single is your superpower, which clearly I'm a fan of singlehood. I was single 29 to 33 real substantive years. I mean, I think the only way to know what you want in a relationship is to be single, is to date around, is to find yourself in and out of relationships. It's the only way. Like you can't guess what you need until you haven't been offered what you need. You can't guess what you want until you've experienced the opposite of what you want. So it's essential that you accrue life experience, both in the confines of being free and wild and single 
and in short relationships, temporary relationships, everything in between. So I think there's tremendous value there. Clearly, I wrote a book about it. I, I think beyond that, like to your point, like I, I think mindfulness is really helpful in the sense of like knowing what you want in a relationship, like the things that you listed off there earlier, like those are like the bar is there. The bar should be at character, thoughtfulness, loyalty, honesty. The problem is, of course, in this day and age, the bar has gotten really low because sometimes those things are unfortunately hard to come by. Dating apps, social media, dating in 2023 is, is, is difficult. But I think we have to realize that reciprocity is always the name of the game. And that is where the bar should be. And if we've done work on ourselves and we know what we bring to the table and we know what we give, loyalty, honesty, compassion, time, thoughtfulness, all these things, it is a one-to-one -one line. It is a line from what you offer to what they should offer in return. That is how we have to make sense of our standards and relationships. And I think the idea of standards is, is really, really important. Like, where do our standards come from? I think where we get in trouble sometimes is we borrow a lot of standards from other people or we'll sit there and we say, I deserve this, that, and the other. And you might very well deserve this, that, and the other. But then when you get into the confines of dating, suddenly you've forgotten about that because you feel like you're falling behind or pressure or whatever it is. I think mindfulness is the key to sitting down and saying, here's a standard I have. It doesn't make me too picky. It's not something I'm going to negotiate on. And the way to prove that is through mindfulness, which is connecting the standard you have with an experience you had in the past. And you say, why? Like once you can connect your past to the present in a standard, that is what makes it unbreakable. And likely it came from, I deserve honesty, for instance, because I was in a relationship in the past where this person was not honest. That is my why. That makes it real. I won't negotiate on it. So we need, we need life experiences and we need to make sense of those life experiences in order to be in the present and not lower the bar because we're afraid of being alone, um, because we're rushing or whatever it may be. So I think it's very important that we sit down and through the lens of mindfulness, which a lot of times is simply making sense of our past experiences so that our present standards and viewpoints leverage them. I think that's like the most important thing we could do going into the present is saying, okay, Let's let's audit our past experiences, even the ones where we disappointed ourselves or we were hurt or betrayed or whatever it was. Let's make sense of those and let's bring, you know, past pain. Let's turn it into present wisdom. Let's turn it into standards and boundaries. Let's make it real with that one word of why. And I think that really is is self-serving both for ourselves and our partner. So there's clarity around that. So powerful in what you just said. And I don't think a lot of people think about that. Like, why do I have these standards? And usually, like you said, it's driven by a past experience. And I think that that clarity will just really like set you up for success because you actually know what's driving it opposed to like, um, if you want to say triggers, because I think a lot of uh, maybe standards might be uh, you might think of, oh, am I too needy wanting this? Mm. Or like, is this just a trigger? But it's actually... Uh, a need of a need of yours that is valid. And usually if it's grounded in like, obviously uh, in a positive way, like I want honesty because, you know, I was deceived in the past and this is how I felt in my experience of it. So I, I love, I love questioning the why of why you have these standards. And I do think standards are very valid and important. That doesn't make you needy or picky. I remember, I remember back in the day, and I'm sure you've gotten this, I'm sure a lot of people have is like, oh, you're, you're a little too picky wanting that, or, you know, like maybe that's too needy, like, you know, and you're going to push them away by talking about that because that's too needy. And it's, mm. it's a load of bullshit. I mean, it's, I think standards is healthy. And I think when you love yourself and you feel that you are worthy, your standards are healthy. They're boundaries that are put in place because you love yourself. And I think that's different. If it's coming from a very needy place, meaning like, oh, I deserve this and I'm entitled to it because, yeah. you know, blah, yeah. blah, blah. I, you know, I could get any man if like a woman's saying, that, then that's really unhealthy. And I don't think, I'm sure the people listening don't think that way, but I, I, I love how you kind of frame that uh, to gain more clarity on those standards. Yeah. Super I mean, cool. I think it's all through the lens of why it has to be through the lens of why that's how we hold ourselves accountable because it's, it's one thing to say, I want this, that, and another, and a partner, but let's make sure you're bringing it as well. And you likely are. And that's what should make it real. I actually just released an episode this morning on something that you just, uh, glossed over too, which is 
the power of speaking those to your partner, um, not making demands, but saying, Hey, here is for, for instance, here's, uh, here's what makes me feel loved. It makes me feel loved when you say or do this thing, speaking that truth. The, the, the challenge that I've, I think a lot of us found find is that, uh, one, we're nervous that if we do that and they reject us, that it'll really hurt. Of course, this is rejection, you know, fear of rejection 101, but more so we also, also found that a lot of people don't speak their needs, don't speak their standards to a partner because they feel that if they speak it to their partner and then their partner gives it to them, that suddenly it's not sincere or it's not real, that they should know. Like I shouldn't have to tell them that I prefer words of affirmation over physical touch or I shouldn't have to tell them that my silence means I'm upset with them. They should know that. And I just did an episode this morning on it because while I certainly think there is an element of you know intuitiveness and empathy and understanding that the right person will have for you, much so more than anyone else, no one is mind readers and the right person absolutely wants you to say, here is how I want to be loved. The right person is begging for that because they want to love you in a way that makes you feel loved. They're the type of, type of person who's like making you happy makes me happy. They want nothing more than that. And I think, I think one of the most romantic things you could do, but I feel like a lot of us are averse to it. We think it's not romantic is to say, here's how I want to be loved. It makes me feel loved when you say this, like, please tell me this more often. I think it's the most romantic thing in the world because for one, it acknowledges the fact that no one is mind readers. No one knows intuitively how to love you. And two, the right person desperately wants that. They want to over deliver. And the fact that you're giving them the blueprint, it doesn't make it unsincere. It doesn't make it fake or anything. If anything, it's the opposite. It shows that that person was willing to check their ego and say, um, you know, I need to do more or I need to do different. And I'm willing to, and I'm going to now because you brought it to my attention. I think it's the mm. most romantic thing in the world. I think it's the the core of compatibility, that the ability and willingness to speak those things. So just a, an anecdote here, there about that, because I keep seeing these TikToks about how like the right person will just know, or like your soulmate oh, will just right. know, which I think is ridiculous. And, and most people would agree, but something about life kind of is like, well, they, they, they should know, or they should, they should be able to figure it out. It's like, maybe, sure, maybe. But right. let's focus on our ability to communicate because the right person wants that. I love how you say the right person. I say that in air quotes because I, uh, it's so true that if you get signs of like somebody doesn't want to have those hard conversations or you feel that you speaking your truth will shake the boat or shake the roof or whatever you want to say, uh, I think that's a red flag because I think that being able to have an open communication about, I feel this way. Um, I'm just sharing this because I want you to understand me. You know, that's healthy. And actually, I remember actually my partner and I were talking last night and we were talking about being um, like showing self-responsibility. Like when you do something wrong or you feel you've, uh, you know, uh, whatever it may be, just taking responsibility from your part in things. I think that's also a really positive mm. thing, but that's, that's partly that communication that I think a lot of people avoid because either it shakes the, that shakes the roof or it's uh, causes tension in the relationship. So they'll avoid those conversations. And I like, I've heard you talk about this too, that this, um, you know, again, not sharing how you feel or, mm. you know, or whatnot in a relationship. And so instead you'll just kind of like let it coast and ignore mm. it and let it like cause you dis-ease in your body because you're not speaking up about it. And so I'm curious what you would say about that, because I think that is a problem in relationships as we avoid these tough conversations. And when we stay in things longer hoping things will get better but yet you're not speaking about what's actually coming up for you yeah uh yeah it's something i i talk a lot about because it's i i think you know combine it with what we were talking about earlier knowing who you are and if you combine it with a willingness to speak up 99 percent of the battle is done but mm. of course to our conversation here speaking up is so easier said than done Fear of rejection could be debilitating. Fear of starting over. Fear of any anything emotionally vulnerable is is debilitating. So I think a lot of my work is how can we incentivize ourselves to speak up and not just speak up in the sense of here are my list of demands, not that, but speak up to say to ask a question. 
here's how I'm feeling. How are you feeling? Or here's what I've noticed. Like, I'm curious where this is coming from. Like, have these conversations, not demands, not confrontation, but conversations. Mm -hmm. And we have to be willing to do these, of course. Anyone will tell you that. The, the key is finding the incentive, finding the incentive so that the worst case scenario would be to sit in confusion for any longer. And the thing I come back to all the time is anytime you speak up, that is anytime you initiate a conversation about how you feel or a question you have, you always win, no matter the outcome, because you either speak up and you get what you want. That is a conversation around clarity. You realize you're on the same page. There was just miscommunication. You're good to go. You speak up, you get what you want. Or you speak up and you get what you need, which is that person says, I'm not ready to give that to you. I'm not the right person. I can't give that to you. And you make you make the conclusion that they're not willing to, therefore, they're not the right person for me. But either way, you get what you want or you get what you need, both of which are self-serving, both of which are compassionate, both of which are honesty in the form of hopefully some action that you could take. So I think if we can push ourselves in the moments where we don't want to have conversations and we say, get what I want, get what I need, get what I want, get what I need. One of the two, hopefully it could push us through that moment and we could just have that conversation. Five minutes of awkwardness, five minutes of whatever, whatever it may be. Um, I think that is probably one of the most powerful tools we could have is that mantra, the mentality of get what I want or get what I need. Find clarity by having conversations, by initiating conversations. I talk a lot about there's that that saying that always floats around social, which is like, whoever cares less wins, which I, I just think is the most ridiculous thing in the world. Um, you know, to care less, to only match energy, I think is the clearest sign that you're not in control of your life. So we have to find a way to not continue to give people something they don't, they don't appreciate, but to be willing to try first, to be willing to love first, and to be willing to have a conversation first. If you pair that with get what I want, get what I need, I think you're 100% heading in the right direction. You'll always be surrounded with a sense of clarity, and you'll always have a direction to go because you're either getting what you want or you're getting what you need. So good. I mean, we could just end the podcast there and that would be enough, but we're not going to, we're going to continue. Uh, no, it's so freaking ass true. I mean, I love that. And that's really taking ownership of your life, right? Is by being able to be uncomfortable because it's going to ultimately serve you. Because I know, again, I've been here. I was in a situation for about four years in a relationship situation where I hoped it to be more than it actually was. And we had many yeah. conversations and I was told the truth, but yet in my mind, I wanted it to be something that it really wasn't. And so I stayed in it. And how many heartbreaks did I have because I stayed into it? And I think, I think very commonly, I don't think it's just myself speaking about this. Like I think a lot of women, possibly men as well, experience this. We stay in it too long because we hope it's, it's going to shift into something or we hear the man or the woman speak the truth, but we ignore it because we want it again to be something like we think that, oh, they're just saying that, or maybe it will change. And I'm sure you've you've heard these conversations a lot and, and probably women, because I know you have a lot of women listeners, I'm sure they've asked you about this. Like, what does he mean? Like, what does this actually mean? Yeah. You know, and, and I think <laughs> men really do kind of, if you're having a conversation, I think they relatively kind of say it as it is, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, more, more or less, I think. I, I think yeah. if you, you know cards on the table, you, you have the right question. I think you, you'll get the right answer, but you have to be willing to hear what is being said, not what you want to hear. And I think everything you just described is like the ultimate pitfall of anyone, men or women. It's living in potential rather than reality. Um, and I, I, you know, it's not because we're bad people. It's not because we're naive or, or anything like that. It's just like, we, we want to believe in hope and intention and, 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 you know, being on the same page, of course we want that. And I think, yeah, I think a lot about that subject and I've done quotes before that are, you know, very to the point. It's like, don't look at who makes promises, look at who keeps them. Don't look at who initiates, look at who's followed for all three. So like we have to look at the right verbs, right? It's easy for people to do the the surface level things that keep you hooked, but it's what comes from that, right? It's, it's, it's how they actually treat you, not how they promise to treat you and so on and so forth. So I think, you know, there's an element to there of just like getting radically real with yourself when it comes to analyzing behavior. But I think that is the key. It's like a lot of time you think about relationships and you think about words like love or in love. And I think 
as much as being in love, of course, is a feeling. And what is love? Love is is a is is a noun, um, but it's also a verb. And I think that that's the problem. I think a lot of times when it comes to getting wrapped up in potential rather than reality is we convince ourselves, yeah, like I am in love, and I think my partner is also in love with me. Like I feel this feeling, but the 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 parallel to that we have to be looking at are the actions like love is a feeling of course but it's it, the, it's a verb like to love is actions like to be loved are to receive actions from that person actions that are that show that they prioritize you actions that show that they make promises and keep them initiate and follow through like we like i think in these instances where we're confused like we need to be looking at actions rather than feelings because someone can pull off an action once or twice and make you feel a certain way. And then you can come in, back in your head and return to that feeling time and time again. But the feeling isn't a reflection of reality. Actions are a reflection of reality. So I think somewhere in, in between those two things is where we need to be radically honest with ourselves. And it's the toughest thing in the world, right? We're combining emotion and action. But that's the lens that we need to look at, not exclusively on the feeling side, but also on the action side. Um, and I think that could maybe give us an element of clarity or it can give us incentive to have a specific conversation around something that is lacking or not consistent. Yeah. I think what people fear more most in this situation is that fear of rejection and, you know, how much that hurts our ego or our worth, if you want to say. And I think that's what people just avoid that pain. But in the long run, it's like, the more you address the current situation, you're able to move on faster if you need to move on or your relationship get, get better because you've addressed these things opposed to yeah. like the fear of. I, I love that you talk about, this is one thing I really, one of the topics I really admire that you talk about because I think it's uh, critical for people to realize this is independence in a relationship. I think a lot of people think like, I'm going to lose my independence or, you know, I can't do this because I'm in a relationship. And I, I don't think that's a healthy way to look at a relationship because a relationship, which I know you could agree, is a very positive thing. It's It should enhance your life. Like two people that have done the work on themselves that really embody their worth, the love for themselves come together. Like, of course, it's going to be something positive, right? And, and why should it be losing your independence? I think you are two independent people coming together to build a life together, hopefully. Um, so what is your, your thought or take on this uh, as far as independence and maybe a misconception of what <laughs> some people yeah. Consider. Well, you, you have triggered my favorite topic of all time. <laughs> so I'll keep it short. I'm yeah. really hot on this topic lately. In fact, that my next book that'll come out, you know, in the next you know, year and a half or so, um, yeah. is going to be on this subject. I don't know. I just, I think a lot about the words we use. Right. And the one that I'm, I'm antagonized by recently is the idea of settling down, even mm -hmm. though it's just a word, it's just a phrase and it, it is what it is. I think a lot of people have really wrapped their understanding around what a relationship is based on a term like that to settle down. Like, I don't think a relationship should settle you down. I think, sure, it settles you down in the sense of you're not dating anymore. You've got a sense of consistency and peace and calm in your life, right? Take that off the table. But I think settle down just gives us the wrong understanding of a relationship. I really do think the right person, the right relationship, the right dynamic should give you more life. And I'm notwithstanding, you know, responsibilities like raising kids, like it should give you more experiences, more travel, more spontaneous things because you have a partner who supports you no matter what. So you should have a willingness to try more things. And I think independence is a big part of that. Like the right partner should make you feel more independent, frankly. And there's something um, that I've talked about before that it's called the dependency paradox, which is a observation in, in childhood that when it comes to a child um and a caregiver that the more attached um and they use the word dependent we're not talking about like codependent but just like dependent emotionally and, and attached uh emotionally the more they feel that attachment to their caregiver the more independent the child is willing to be right they're willing to take a first step or wander off because that they know that that person has their back and if they get hurt or if they get lost like that person's going to come and find them and support them and so on and so forth it's called the dependency paradox right opposites the more dependent the closer you are the more eager you are to be independent and i i think a lot about that in childhood and i think that is the dynamic in the healthy way 
that we should have in uh, adulthood with a partner. The more, the closer you feel to someone, the more independent you should both feel to be because you have that, that groundedness with your partner. So that means you should be willing to try new things on your own, to have a sense of inner independence and outer independence alongside of that person. So I think really gauging the health of your relationship through the lens of, do I feel independent? Do I inspire my partner to also be independent? And then I also think just like generally speaking, I think a lot of the reason that men suck at relationships or just <laughs> screw things up is, is, is around this idea because the media, movies, social media, words like settle down. A lot of men think that a relationship means that all of a sudden their manhood's taken away their, you know, masculinity and, you know, I'm going to be a conqueror of the world and live my best life. A, a, a partnership is going to take that away. And I think a lot of that's just like we brainwashed ourselves because it's just not true. The right person should make you get more out of life. The right person should introduce new elements to your life and the right person should encourage your independence. And again, these are a lot of shoulds and coulds and hopefully woulds, right? But I think if we can kind of reinvent our definition of the purpose of a relationship, which is to amplify happiness that you've already worked on on your own, which is independent on your own, that, you know, the purpose of life is the same as when you're single as when you're in a relationship. It's to get more out of life. And it's just moving into another phase with another person. So I could talk a lot about that, but I think combining the ideas of more, not settle down, independent, um, I think you could find hopefully some clarity there that makes you excited to be in a relationship. Not that, all right, all right, I live my life. So now it's fine. I'm just going to get into a relationship. No, it's like, yes, let's do this so we can get more out of life. That's my stance. <laughs> yeah, no, it's so good. And like you said, you could go on and on and about it. And I, I probably could as well. And I, I, uh, I really support it because for example, my partner and I, I went, he was away about two months, two and a half months for a business trip. Uh, in Burma, which is third world country, oh, wow. lots yeah. of danger. It was nuts. Yeah. But then on the flip side, <laughs> I uh, ended up going to uh, Croatia and also London for events and whatnot. And he was so supportive because he knew I was doing something I love, something for myself. And if anything, I felt our connection more powerful because, you know, we support one another and we're very connected in the time that we're independent as well. And I think that support of one another is, again, cheering on what we both enjoy and what we're doing and yet staying connected in it. And uh, I think that is really healthy. So I'm, I'm all about it. I think, again, I think when you come as if you want to say, I don't even know if I want to use this term, a whole person to a relationship. I would rather say like, if you come into a relationship really grounded in yourself and your worth and your love for yourself, then I think you, again, you're building from a healthy foundation. And, um, I think I like that. I like that a lot. Um, I think the, the point that I would build off that, that I usually add to my diatribe about the purpose of a relationship. And I, I was on Rachel Hollis's podcast about a month back and she said something and just glossed over it real, real fast. And I've hung on to it because the words she used, I thought were so powerful. She said that at a point in her life, you know, she was divorced and then found a new partner. She said at a certain point in her life, she stopped looking for a partner that she could build life with and instead look for someone she could do life with. And I think yeah, beautiful. there's, Again, we're just literally just talking about words here. We're talking about, you know, settle down and we're just talking about words. But I, there's such a powerful difference between looking for someone to build life with and looking for someone to do life with. The mm. former is a lot of pressure. If you're looking for someone to build life with, that means that, you know, th logically through the use of these words, that means that before you find that person, you're not building, you're waiting, you're in the holding stage and we need to find that person. So we could finally build the life that makes me happy together. That puts a lot of pressure on you, on their partner, and on the relationship. The opposite is exactly what you're talking about here. You could use the word whole or complete or whatever you want or just fulfilled, but you do the work on your own, whether you've been single or in and out of relationships, you have found purpose in yourself and values and standards and independence. And now you're looking for someone who has done the same and together you're meeting and you're just doing life together. You're building in a sense, but the pressure isn't there to start from zero and build together. Your purpose is you're a complete person on your own and they are too. And you're just doing life together. You're getting more out of life together. So I think there's a powerful difference between the two. And I think a lot of people end up in relationships that are rushed, that maybe aren't right for them because they've built this mentality of I'm not building the life that I deserve until I have a partner to build with. 
And I just, I don't think that's fair to us. I think we have so much capacity to build on our own and then find someone and love and partnership is such a gift. Of course, it could take it to the next level, but it's, it's, it's taking life and you're, you're just doing it together because you've already built the foundation for both of yourselves and you're bringing, Absolutely. bringing it into unity of some form. Yeah. And how beautiful that is. I love this line. It stuck with me forever. I don't know who initially saw, said it, but it was on this conversation of you need to love yourself when you're by yourself. And I think going back to that single singledom uh, is, are you, when you're alone, do you feel lonely or are you alone? And how do you feel mm. in that space? And I think if you are feeling, and I know during COVID, for example, a lot of people felt this loneliness, especially the extroverts and whatnot. But to me, that's something to look at and to question and ask why, because I think I love being alone. I find joy in being alone, especially when I'm in nature. I, I connect most to myself when I'm in that space. And I think it's healthy. And I think if you do not feel comfortable when you're alone and you feel lonely instead, I think that's where you need to do more self-inquiry and really gain awareness. Like, why is that feel, why are you feeling that feeling? I could go on and on about that subject, which I'm sure you yeah. can as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, one thing I want to touch on, cause I, I want to really honor your time, but I recently heard on the news or I don't know, just on the radio or whatnot that I think it was millennials are now deterring away from marriage and even relationships like monogamy. Like they are, you know, not taking it like, like marriages are so much less these days because of how dating has shifted and just like our, I guess how our world is now there's, I don't know, there's so many factors I'm sure, but what's your, what's your thoughts on this or what are you hearing in that regards? And what can you say about it? <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's a good, interesting point because I was actually looking at some of the the data that you're referencing um, for the book I'm potentially writing. Um, I don't know. I think there's two ways to interpret it. I think there's the one way, which is relationships are so difficult, people have given up way. Um, or there's the, you know, people are happy being single. People are happy having temporary but rewarding relationships until they find the one that's right for them. People are more patient nowadays. I, of course, being the the optimist, um, lean towards the latter. Um, you know, I think if you if you look at just women in general, women, what was the data? It was like women are now the average woman gets married at like 29 now versus 24. Um, the average age of a woman getting married was like 24 in the year 2000. And now it's like 28 or 29. I need to be fact checked, but it's somewhere I'm in there. It's like, it's it's like actually... a big I'm surprised it's, it's actually variance. that young. I thought it was going to be like in 30s. I thought that's how it shifted, but uh, yeah, it's so it's somewhere in there. But regardless, it's like it's... a six a six or so year variance over 20 years, mm -hmm. which is astronomical. Right. So you know, I see data like that, and I say I say that's that's great. That means women are are being more patient in their own regard. Potentially, that's how I interpret that. I think there's the mm -hmm. the, the downer way to be it would be to interpret it that you know dating is difficult. People are giving up, and I'm sure there's an element of that too. It's just taking longer to find a partner because you know men. I think the economy. It's more difficult to find your foothold in your career, and people don't want to get married until they can afford a house and to raise kids. I'm sure there's lots of micro and macro elements at play here. Um, but being the optimist, I, t I like to look at it as people are being patient, people are knowing their worth. Um, and you know, maybe there's more frustrating dating experiences in between just with the, you know, proclivity of, of dating apps and things like that. But, um, you know, it's the year 2023, I, I think, you know, the, all things aside, I think it's, it's easier and harder at the same time. I think both of those things can be true <laughs> at the same time. It's, it's so true, right? I mean, we're both in relationships, so, uh, but we deeply understand the other flip side of that, of how yes. challenging it can be, but yet there is so much accessible to us. Actually, my partner and I met on social media. So there you go. So, yeah. I mean, there's a, that, that's a new option, right? That, that didn't exist when yeah, we were- Easier, in easier, but also harder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so I have so much I would love to dig more deep into you, but deep into you, deep questions like to ask <laughs> you. But uh, so yeah, you provide so much 
obviously on your podcast. I want people to listen. You drop two episodes a week. They're solo episodes. You share so much on your social media and of course your books, your journal and all the things. So uh, just drop right here. People best find you. Of course, it will all be in the show notes. Of course. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I always love talking about these subjects. I love talking about myself. So <laughs> I appreciate you giving me a platform to do so. Uh, yeah, I mean, the podcast, New Mindset Who Dis, Case.Kenny on, on Instagram. I think um, I'm really passionate about the book I wrote recently. That's Bold of You. It's available on Amazon, but it kind of is a, a great uh, encapsulation of everything we've been talking about, the power of, the power of mindfulness, both in your dating life and your inner life and your independence and, and everything in between. So I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I'm not done yet. <laughs> but uh, oh, nice. Let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, two things. Okay, so first of all, what is what is the most powerful subject you share on your podcast that you feel most are gravitating towards, and why do you think that is? I mean, the dating the dating as a topic is for sure what a lot of people come to me for. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's just. You know, I, I think nowadays, like people are stressed out by how many, you know, people and all, everyone has good intentions about like, oh, don't do this, don't do that, ask this question, ask, you know, wait three days. Like, I think we're overwhelmed with dating advice nowadays because everyone has an opinion based on what's worked for them. And that's very valid. But I think it's added to a lot of, of, angst because it's like well this person said that and this person mm -hmm. says i need to act cool but this per you know it's just like we're just confused um so i think for me because i try to stay away from that and it's more ask yourself this and be honest and do what the answer you come up with is keep it that way let's keep it here mm -hmm. as opposed to here 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 so i don't know I, I i know that that helps me find a little bit of calm in the areas of life that um present uncertainty to me so i'm thinking that that is the answer for other people yeah. You know, it, that makes me think of how you shared this one episode. I remember you were talking about the heart and the head and we need to be mm. obviously using both, but I think so many people are using <laughs> their head because they're comparing like this story that people said to them, or they're comparing this relationship that's out there. So they're being directed by that opposed to like actually what they feel in their heart, which I think is really, um, I think it's so powerful and I love that you, I mean, obviously you, you, what you speak, you do. So you actually do that self inquiry to be guided by your heart, but yet also using your head, but you're connecting both. So I think that's, yeah. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. And yeah, I, you know, if people, you know, if there's people who listen to my podcast a lot, I tend to repeat themes and the theme that I always repeat is balance. Like, I think if we could find a balance between head and heart, a balance between being inspired by others, but finding our own truth, like that's the secret to life. The, the challenge is when we get off kilter and we're going one or the other, we're, we're too logical and we don't give our emotions enough or we're too emotional. We don't give reality enough. So balance, I really do think is synonymous with self-awareness. And if we could find it um, through mindfulness or, you know, through whatever it may be, I think that's really going to help. Yeah. Okay. Case, I ask you my closing question because I want to really, I, again, I have a, I have so many questions to ask you, but I just want people to go dig in deeper because you share so much and I can't, of course, ask all the things in an hour, but <laughs> closing question that I ask everybody, if you were to share a piece of wisdom, a life lesson that you've learned along your vast journey, and you just feel it's something you need to shout out to everybody in the world right now, what would that piece of wisdom be and why? Yeah, the one that I'm I really gravitate towards, it's not even my own, but and it, it really speaks to the power of everyday experiences. I really gravitate towards regular people, not necessarily the experts or the the best selling authors. I love learning from regular people. And I read this quote from someone on Reddit once. It was an anonymous person, just an anonymous person sharing what they learned. And I and I repeat it all the time, and it's something we actually haven't touched on. The quote is the difference between a head full of memories and a head full of regret is your ability to forgive yourself. Self-forgiveness being the, the catalyst there. And I just, I think that's so true. Like everything we've been talking about here, right? Like how do we make, how do we make standards? Will we make sense of our past in order to move forward? We have to find a way to forgive ourselves. And really I, I talk a lot about forgiveness. You know, I think forgiving yourself is synonymous with giving yourself a second chance, trusting yourself again, and that really is back to the way we started. Like the reason I started the podcast is to 
avoid looking back and regretting not being honest with myself, having a, a, a heaping pile of memories, some good, some bad, but all interconnected by a sense of patience with myself and forgiveness for myself, I think is did the best gift you can give yourself. So um, hopefully that that inspires people to be a little bit more kind to themselves, but to also have a sense of eagerness to say, okay, I, I messed up or that was not what I deserved, but I, I'm willing to give myself a second chance in the form of self-forgiveness. And as a result, I can look back and I've got a big pile of memories. Some are good, some are bad, but I'm still moving forward because I forgive myself. So I would say that. So good. And I, I just have to add to that because honestly, it's one of my most passionate subject is the self-acceptance piece. I think you need self-acceptance to get to self-love. I feel it's a pathway to self-love and that is the forgiveness. And I think so many people, and I, I talked about this in a mastermind, so many people hold on to those things that they didn't uh, forgive themselves or others for. And I think that's what leaves a weight on our shoulders and doesn't let us get into full acceptance of what has shaped us to be who we are today. Like I have done a lot of things I regret, if you want to say, or things that I could have done better choices, paths I could have taken and whatnot. But I forgive myself for making that decision because I knew best from where I came from. Like I knew yep. best from the situation I was in. And I love that you talk about that because I'm so passionate about that self-forgiveness. Um, I think that is the piece that a lot of people don't get to. And I think, again, talking about journaling, I think that's where you will, will get there is by letting it out, like letting your just go like, like exhale, <laughs> yeah. forgive yourself yeah. for what has happened. As Honestly, it shaped you to who you are today. If you didn't go through that, if you didn't make that mistake, maybe you wouldn't have learned the lessons you've learned today to shape you into who you are, to be that better person, to maybe find the right relationship or yeah. Okay. I could go on and on, <laughs> but yeah. Amen though. Amen. I think it's, I think it's so well said. I mean, cause if you, it, what's the other quote, if you erase the mistakes of your past, you erase the wisdom of your present. So, I mean, it's like, we just got to find a way to connect the two in a way that's compassionate. And I think mindfulness journaling, the whole thing is, is the way. Awesome. So good. This has been such a phenomenal conversation. I, I so appreciate you. I know you're a busy man. And uh, how many downloads do you have on your podcast? Like 80 million plus, maybe more now. Uh, it's not know. It's not quite there. That would be uh, great. I mean, it's, it's in the 30s. Okay. Well, <laughs> you'll get there soon, I'm sure. It's yeah, ridiculous. Sure. Yeah. And I, I just want to honestly like congratulate you for just, you know, Thank showing you. up honestly just as you are. And I think that's really powerfully why people connect to you. And I think that is a message to everybody. It's like, how could you be more you and more really deep in knowing who you are so you could show up to the world and actually magnetize more people because you're being you. And so I thank you well, for being that. You so I thank much. you for sharing just, you know, again, just a regular dude, just sharing, you know, <laughs> you know, what you're passionate about and yep. actually serving people in, um, you know, getting to know themselves more through mindfulness and also being able to bring them best, their best self into a relationship. So anyways, appreciate you so thank much. You. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs>